initially complained of blurred vision, which had resolved with prescription glasses. For a duration of one month prior to presentation, Dasuni had begun to complain of tunnel vision. In her own words, she has said that she can see only the things in front of her eyes. She can't see what's surrounding. However, this had not impacted on her studies performance, and she had no difficulties in maneuvering around objects in the periphery of her field of vision. Interestingly, Dasuni had also been prescribed hearing aids when she had presented with hearing loss approximately one and a half years back. She, however, rarely used them at school and still continued to get good marks. In the background, Dasuni is the older of two siblings and she lives with her parents, eight-year-old younger sister in Gampaha. She comes from a low-income family. Her father is 54 years old. He's a driver and he's a daily paid worker. Mother is 30 years old and works at a garment factory in a supervisory capacity. Dasuni yes. obtained 168 marks at the scholarship exam last year and now attends a popular girls' school in Gampaha while her sister still attends the village school. Dasuni's parents are not married. Her father has two children from a previous marriage. They're both grown up. They were 24 and 17, and he rarely sees them. Dasuni's father had been against having any more children, and he does not financially support any of his children. So there are frequent quarrels between Dasuni's parents frequently ending in verbal and physical aggression in this background. However, Dasuni is very fond of her father. She believes her mother to be too strict and wishes that her mother agrees with her father and complies with all of his wishes. Dasuni's mother, on the other hand, spares no expense for her education. Her entire focus is on making Dasuni as educated as possible, because she does not want her to end up like herself. The day before Dasuni complained of hearing loss, there had been a particularly big argument between her parents. This was when Dasuni had been selected to the popular girls' school with her high marks in the scholarship exam. The father had been against the decision and had wanted to use these funds uh, that the mother had set aside to repay a loan. Dasuni's mother recalled that after this particular argument, which had physical and verbal aggression, Dasuni had been sat down by her father and told her that he was not a good father because he can't provide for them as per the mother's account. So as you can see, there are frequent incidents at home. Dasuni wishes that she could not see and that she could not hear. Dasuni is also a perfectionist. She was the best student in her class in the village school. The teachers had expected her to get more than 190 marks at the scholarship exam. She also has very high expectations of herself. She wants to be a doctor and performs to, performs to the best of her capacity in all the exams that she faces. But she now finds it harder to be the best among the students in this new school. However, everyone marvels at how well she is doing overcoming her disabilities. There were no other focal neurological signs and there were no features of underlying psychosis or depressive disorder. On mental state examination, she was a very pleasant girl, dressed and groomed appropriately, wearing glasses. She was not wearing hearing aids. The growth and development were appropriate to the stated age. She was initially cautious in her manner but warmed up to the interviewer gradually. She was very cooperative and pleasant. Speech was normal in rate, volume, tone, and it was relevant and coherent. Mood was predominantly anxious. Range was moderate to severe, and it was reactive and congruent. There were no risks uh, expressed towards herself or others. In her thought content, she was remarkably unconcerned about her disabilities and their impact. There were no psychotic symptoms. Her cognitive functions as tests tested were intact, and she had poor insight into her presentation. In the psychometric assessment, the nonverbal IQ as tested by the test of nonverbal in intelligence version 3 came to 102, which was average. 
Her scholastic skills were also average on assessment and her physical examination was unremarkable. There were no focal neurological signs. So she was managed as an inpatient. We did inward observations, which revealed interesting observations about her capacity to hear without her hearing aids and her capacity to maneuver uh, without her periphery of vision. And we liaised with the endocrinology, ENT, and eye uh, teams at LRH, and we excluded organic causation. There was a whole host of investigations that were performed including perimetry, uh, evoke potentials, and MRIs. And we liaised with the endocrinology team to optimize her management of diabetes. We started her on sertraline starting from 6.125 milligrams in the morning, and we titrated the do dose upwards, and we prescribed a short course of benzodiazepines for her anxiety. There was involvement of the multidisciplinary team, including the psychologists and social workers, nurses, doctors, and we had a family meeting with the participation of her father. We provided them reassurance that the condition is temporary, well recognized, and caused by an inability to become aware of sensory information. This was the license for her change. And in this family meeting, we also discussed about the maintaining psychological and social factors and discussed some strategies that can be put forth uh, for those. In the longer term, we focus on removing factors which reinforce these symptoms of disability while helping with personal and social difficulties. We would be employing brief and focused psychological treatments. And we would, of course, continue to monitor her physical health on routine screening. That's the case presentation. Thank you, Dr. Hasala. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Darshani Hetiarachi, and she will be speaking on um, the case discussion uh, for this case presented. Uh, Dr. Darshini is a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist at the Lady Ridgeway Hospital. Over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. Lanka Medical Association and the Sri Lanka College of Psychiatrists for giving me this opportunity. So I will be uh, mainly focusing on the assessment and management of functional neurological symptom disorders in children. So before starting on my presentation, I would like the audience to focus on this slide. Just imagine now you are in a busy pediatric board or in a pediatric neurology unit, a child presenting with neurological symptoms where all the neurological examinations and in investigations are normal. How would you feel? Obviously, we will feel that this child is lying. This child is manipulating. Waste of our time, waste of our investigations. We would have spent this time for another child who is coming with genuine symptoms and kick him to a child psychiatry ward where we are stigmatizing and discriminating this child. So I would like to ask this from you all. Are they liars? No, they have genuine reasons for their behaviors and presentations. Now let's focus on what are these functional neurological symptom disorders or conversion disorders. According to the DSM-5 criteria, one or more symptoms of altered voluntary motor or sensory function and clinical findings provide evidence of incompatible between the symptoms and recognized neurological or medical conditions, the symptom or deficit is not better explained by another medical or mental disorder. And the symptoms or deficits causes clinically significant distress or functional impairment. So what are the typical symptoms and signs? Weakness or paralysis, abnormal movements, swallowing problems, altered speech, memory loss, sensory loss or paresthesia, impaired vision, like and also tunnel vision, which we see in the previous case, which was discussed by Dr. Hasala, and um, seizures or non-epileptic attack. And what are the associated uh, psychological features? 
they can they have primary gain where they they keeping internal conflicts outside their awareness and also they present with secondary gain that is the patient gain tangible advantages and benefits as a result of being sick and lapelle indifference where the paradoxical absence of psychological distress despite a serious medical illness or symptoms of a health condition so what is the prevalence children with functional neurological disorders make up uh, up to 10% of children present into pediatric general neurological clinics and up to 20% of children present into epilepsy clinics uh, 20% of adolescents admitted to hospital for the management of suspected or convulsive status epilepticus and population based studies suggest that the incidence and prevalence of functional symptoms peak in adolescent and early adulthood and we, this is more common among girls and boys then there are some uh, posit like common positive uh, neurological sounds uh, signs which we call rule in signs found on physical examination in children with functional neurological disorders one is the across system that is the symptoms are more marked when the child attend to them and less marked when the child's attention is directed elsewhere and symptoms are variable across context for example a child presenting with visual loss can use a mobile phone but cannot see the text that she needs to read in the classroom and tremor in a limb is less when the child is distracted by the neurologist so likewise they can have cross symptoms and there is the gait difficulty they are a swaying gait to apparent loss of balance with a narrow base gait uh, each foot is lifted of the ground as if required great effort and put back down uh, as if requiring great effort and the child walks with bent knees actually which requires more strength than normal walking the child uh, presenting with weakness but he is having a, a movement which needs more more energy and then an uncoordinated gait where the patient sways mm -hmm. lurches and appears to find it difficult to balance but does not fall at this yeah a base here and also they can have weakness generalized so partial uh, discordance between strength or functional ability of the child's affected body part on formal examination and during routine tasks example moving around on the hospital bed the child presenting with the paralysis but when no one is observing the child may be moving on the hospital bed and leave weakness not con conforming to an anatomical distribution like arms and legs weakness on opposite side of the body so these are some uh, rule in symptoms and the tremor a variable distribution of frequency of the child's tremor when examined at different times and the child's tremor changes with contralateral body movements which is called entrainment and sensory symptoms uh, sensory symptoms not uh, conforming to it uh the metal um, distribution and hemisensory loss when a sharp midline distribution visual loss as in the previous case like the tunnel vision and a uh, preserved response to menace reflex that is blink response to visual threat where the child may uh, complain that the child is having a visual impairment but when you move an object towards the child's eye fastly child will blink the eye that is called menace reflex so so those are some uh, rule in signs which we can use to see with, to uh, uh, give the diagnosis more towards the functional neurological disorder and let's see what are the etiological factors here this functional neurological symptom disorder then uh, the etiology can be explained using this biopsychosocial model so there can be various biological psychological and social factors which can contribute to developing functional neurological symptom disorders uh, so let's focus from the biological symptom level so there had been many studies done worldwide uh, so the many studies have given evidence uh, towards this etiological factor so what let's focus on biological symptom level in uh, children who are coming with functional neurological disorder 
they have increased activation of autonomic nervous system and increased arousal, which lead to increased heart rate, respiratory rate, hyperventilation, dilated pupils, dry mouth, sweating, uh, body tension. And this can even lead to prodromal or premonitory symptoms in children with functional seizures. So sometimes when children, some children coming with true seizures as well as functional seizures, where sometimes they say that they are having prodromal symptoms. So we can understand that this autonomic hyperarousal can lead to for them to like uh, get these symptoms. And then the dysregulation of the hypothalamus pituitary axis and circadian rhythm. So the pulse repeated activation of the HPA axis due to multiple uh, stressors, it can lead to changes in epigenetic programming process, which lead to exaggerated response of brain and body for frequent stressors, the autonomic system, immune, immune inflammatory system, pain system, and glial cells in the brain. And also... Studies have shown that the children with functional neurological disorder can have elevated CRP. And EEG uh, studies have shown increased brain arousal, activation changes in connectivity in the resting state and changes in brain connectivity during a functional seizure as well. So these are some studies. Uh, favorable uh, findings and the MRI studies suggest plasticity changes in the brain and aberrant changes in brain network, even with children who are having functional neurological disorders. And the ne next level is the emotional processing system level, where the children with functional neurological disorder tend to allocate more resources to uh, emotional stimuli. Example, emotion phases, that is, uh, like they spend more time on checking the environment for the presence of threats. And the cognitive system level, where the neurocognitive tests have shown uh, individuals who, who are presenting with functional neurological disorders have deficits in executive function, working memory, cognitive flexibility, decision speed, and information processing speed and poor sense of control. The sense of control means the extent to the individual perceives him or her herself to be in control. So in children with functional neurological disorders have reported that less control over their motor symptoms and they experience these symptoms as involuntary. And more selective attention, that is children's ability to focus on a particular stimulus of his or her choice and poor cognitive inhibition, that is, child's ability to suppress attention to unwanted stimuli. So I think we all can understand children tend to uh, pay more attention on their symptoms and have poor cognitive inhibition, that the ability to suppress attention to unwanted stimuli. And the other thing is that illness promoting cognitive processes. So these are the uh, cognitive system findings which we have seen in children with functional neurological disorders. So what is the mental health system level? The comorbid mental health conditions can increase the development of functional neurological disorders and the personality traits like so low social skills, high neuroticism are also risk factors. The physical health system, the Individuals, the studies have shown that the individuals who are having epilepsy, uh, they the 20, uh, 14 to 20 percent of children who are having epilepsy can have uh, functional neurological disorders as well. And then the social system level that is in schools and so in political, ecological context and the parental mental health issues, quality of attachment with the caregivers, stress and adverse childhood experiences. If you can recall about the case which was presented by Dr. Hasala, in that uh, case scenario, that child has experienced many psychosocial stressors throughout her childhood, so which may have create a, a result in, in her presentation. So all the etiological factors which I uh, mentioned earlier, we can put it into this simple paragraph uh, picture where the experience like uh, uh, 
adverse childhood experiences, repeated adverse childhood experiences, which lead to stress-related activation of uh, HPA axis and then epigenetic changes in the brain uh, and later lead to functional neurological disorder vulnerability. So uh, the, this picture shows a very comprehensive explanation about all the etiological factors which I mentioned during my previous sli slides. I mean, you may feel that this is a very compact picture, but if you uh, start from the above, like genetic and epigenetic susceptibility in a child and fetal programming, we have prenatal stressors and previous stressors, early uh, life social environment, sex, pre-existing morbidities, all these things lead to adverse childhood experiences. So with this adverse childhood experiences, depending on the timing of the child's development and the intensity or the severity of the stressors the child have gone through and the duration, whether the stressors be in uh, short term or long term, and then uh, the role, the weaknessing or victimization and type of the stressor. For example, a natural a disaster or a man-made and all these factors and then lead to allostatic process where neuroendocrine stress responsiveness and immune system overactivation and changes in brain development, then epigenetic programming, uh, transcriptome, sleep and cardiac uh, circadian rhythm changes, metabolism, redox state. So after all these things that then the child after ad, uh, experiencing additional stressors health behaviors coping lifestyle aging all these things can lead to uh, organisms equilibrium so if the child is strong enough to face all these things then the child can move to adaptation or the resilience level or if the child is unable to withstand all these kind of stressors that the child have gone through then the child will develop maladaptation or vulnerability to these uh, conditions and then the disparate health and developmental outcomes at the end child increase the risk or vulnerability to develop functional neurological symptom disorders. So I think after uh, this uh, slide, I think even if you were thinking that these children were lying, now I think you may have changed your mind. Actually, they are not lying. They have real, genuine reasons for their behaviors. Now let's move on to the management of pediatric functional neurological disorders. So this management of functional uh, uh, pediatric fun functional neurological dis uh, disorders is uh, always the multidisciplinary team approach where we have to get involved the pediatrician, pediatric neurologist, depending on the symptoms and the condition which the child is presenting. And also the child psychiatrist, uh, physiotherapist, speech therapist, educational psychologist, social worker. So likewise, it has to be always multidisciplinary team management approach. So the management we can discuss in multiple levels. One is the biological system level, where we have to do a detailed neurological assessment to exclude any kind of neurological condition and neurophysiological neurophysi regulation physical therapy or physiotherapy and depending on the condition or the disability where the child is having an occupational therapy speech therapy movement training via habit reversal for episodic symptoms and uh, use of movement and rhythm as neurophysiological and emotional regulation strategies so those are the biological system management and then the psychological or cognitive system level management where one is the behavioral interventions there are, it comes the sleep routines time tabling or scheduling increasing engagement in enjoyable activities or decreasing maladaptive behaviors used to avoid or prevent symptoms sometimes called safety behaviors. So we always should advise the children as well as the parents to avoid these safety behaviors. Otherwise, the symptoms are going to be reinforced and continue. 
and cognitive approaches and cognitive behavior therapy, which targets the catastrophic symptom expectations and other maladaptive cognitions, thinking patterns and psychological processes. And learning interventions for children with identified learning difficulties. And also, we need to focus on emotion regulation interventions. And uh, the other level, I think uh, if you were uh, fo focusing on uh, Dr. Hasala's uh, presentation, that child had uh, like, experienced so many psychosocial resources and there are so many family dynamics, unresolved family conflicts. So it's very important. Uh, when we see a child coming with functional neurological disorder to assess the family uh, status or the family conditions, what can uh, be a main a maintaining factor or the precipitating factor. So family system level management is very important. One thing is the biopsychosocial assessment with the child and family and co-construction of a formulation with the child and family. And psychoeducation. Psychoeducation plays a major role in managing functional neurological disorders. Where first thing that we need to give the explain the diagnosis to the children and the family, and uh, it's very important to explain the predisposing, precipitating, and maintaining factors because sometimes. Like, as I mentioned earlier, even the parents, uh, there are two types of parents. Some group of parents might think that this child is actually like, child is manipulating. But the other group of parents might not agree to accept the diagnosis. They will keep asking for investigations. They will keep, uh, they may uh, move from one doctor to other, thinking that this child is having a real organic condition and they want to exclude the do further investigation. So it's very important to have a better therapeutic relationship with the family and a trusting relationship with the family. They are Psychoeducation comes a major plays a major role. So we have to explain about the diagnosis and also about the predisposing, precipitating, and perpetuating factors. And then to redirect the focus of attention of all family members away from FND symptoms. Because what we have seen in many uh, instances, when a child is having a condition, they get undue attention from the whole family, not only from the nuclear family, they also get undue attention from the extended family. So there it's very important to address these things and uh, try to di direct their attention away from these symptoms. Otherwise, the child is going to continue the symptoms. And family interventions, decreasing family accommodation to the illness, encouraging the child to use regulation strategies and habit reversal skills and other strategies independently and using motivators to reinforce functional skills and adaptive skills and to minimize the risk sick role. And also it's very important to focus on other formal family therapy interventions to address family conflicts uh, and marital conflicts, unresolved grief issues or issues pertaining to maltreatment. There we try to reduce the stressors which are related within the family environment and which act as a maintaining, um, precipitating and maintaining factors for these functional uh, neurological disorders. And at the social system level, we should try our best to uh, like reintegrate the child to his or her normal social life as early as possible. So these are the management approaches that we consider when we are managing a child with functional neurological disorder. Actually, the uh, pharmacolog place of pharmacological management is very much limited unless the child is having uh, child psychiatric conditions like anxiety, depression. Uh, so it comes to the end of my presentation about the functional neurological uh, symptom disorders in children. So if you have any questions, uh, I think uh, we can open the audience for the questions.
Thank you very much, Dr. Darshini. If the audience has any questions, please raise your hand and we can send the microphone around. Uh, because of the childless, childhood adversity, yes, some, some children they get resilience while other children becomes uh, they couldn't bear it up. So what what differentiate between how what are the factors which cause some children become resilience and while other children become in the Actually, you don't like it again. We can expect every child who go through the same kind of childhood trauma are not going to develop the same kind of childhood uh, psychiatric condition. There are multiple factors again determine whether this child is going to develop a, a child like psychiatric condition or not. One is the genetic uh, predisposition or the genetic component, and then the attachment, whether the child has, has had a secure attachment, then that can be a protective factor. If the child has already been experiencing multiple trauma and having insecure attachment, then the child is more vulnerable. If after that, if the child is experiencing traumatic experiences, the insecure attachment, uh, repeated trauma, then the child is more vulnerable. So, likewise, it's a very dynamic uh, process which uh, gets. It involves so many factors, so which which is going to determine whether this child is going to be a logical consequence or so not. Any further questions? We have ample time. Uh... Um, I think in your management, you explained that one of the first steps of managing would be to psychoeducate the patient and the parents and the extended family if they're involved. So in that, you explained uh, the diagnosis, telling them the diagnosis. I This is an area that I feel a bit jittery about because when you say it's functional, uh, that can resonate quite differently with different sets of parents. So how do you, any practical tips or how to you know navigate around this uh, area that we are a bit anxious about? Yes, actually, when I am explaining this to the children, what I usually say, I would say, if I explain it in season, but I usually say, 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 I and on top of that, I give a couple of examples which I have previously explained. So that then the parents start thinking that this is my child is not the child who's only presenting like this. There are other children also coming. This is so many children like this. So uh, those are the ways that usually I used to explain 
and try to like minimize the discrimination coming from that uh, resistance coming from the pain. Will you sit them together and talk about it, or is it better to you not talk to the parents separately and then? Definitely, usually, uh, like child psychiatry, we talk to the parents. We we always have multiple sessions. You know, we talk to the child separately. We uh, talk to the parents separately, and again, we might talk to the the whole family together. Likewise. Uh, Beyond it, like when we are discussing, when we are explaining these kind of things, definitely we have to talk to the parents alone, like without the children. Thank you. There is one question uh, in our chat. What are the practical strategies used to restructure the cognitions or the underlying stressors in this child? What are the practical strategies used to restructure the cognitions or the underlying stressors in this child? Yeah, again, uh, you may not only this child, right? A child question. Uh, well, the question is directed for this child, but then, yeah, please. So, yeah. so uh, there are multiple uh, techniques that we use. Uh, changing the uh, like cognitive errors the children are having in these conditions and uh, here uh, one thing that we need them to be aware about their psychological stressors and then uh, be aware about their own emotion and most of the time what actually happens is that they are not aware about their own emotions they don't know about their emotions and the physiological changes which comes with their emotion. So first thing, it's very important for them to realize that these physiological changes occur secondary to their emotion. And first thing, they have a better understanding about their, their emotions and, and the physiological changes which occur secondary to their emotions. And then we have to help them to regulate their emotions which will help them to regulate their psychological physiological symptoms. Then they will start thinking that these physiological symptoms occur secondary to my emotions. That is one thing. And also if the children are very young, sometimes we might not be able to directly address their cognitive errors. In that kind of situations, we use the behavioral techniques, relaxation exercises, uh, some kind of uh, distraction techniques even. Uh, yeah, those are the things that uh, I mean with the uh, understanding the emotions and then the physiological changes secondary to it. And uh, that is usually what we do. Thank you, Madam. I hope that uh, answers this question uh, from our online platform. Um, we invite uh, those in person and those online again uh, because uh, we do have uh, some more time left. Uh, please uh, ask any question. I hope uh, the speakers are okay to answer anything related to child, child and adolescent psychiatry, not specific to this case presented. Uh, please, we are open for discussion. We have another question. Um, should these uh, children be managed in the psychiatry ward when they are first when they first uh, present? Should they be managed within the psychiatry ward, or if, because the present I think the question is around the presentation would ideally come to the OPD setting. So in that case, uh, what should be the next steps, or how should they be? Present? Yeah, ideally, whenever we see a, a child coming with any kind of physical symptom. We can't take a risk. We must exclude any organic forces, right? So first thing that these children should be referred to the pediatric ward or the pediatric neurology unit because of the medical officer at the OPD. I, I don't not think that they have the capacity to 
uh, help whether this is a functional or non-functional. So ideally, these children should be managed the pediatric ward and the pediatric neurology ward. And the first, once the organic causes are excluded, we can pay, uh, start management in the psychiatric unit. But still, we should always like uh, uh, we should not keep the, these children in the ward setting for long the time. Then they will develop institutionalization. So we usually try our best to send them home and you know manage them in the community setting and, uh, to minimize the sick uh, like illness uh, behavior. So like if we and also while the child is in the hospital, we should not encourage the sickness road. Like if the child is having a disability in walking, we should never provide a wheelchair. Because if the child is in the pediatric ward, in the pediatric neurology ward, there is a high chance for them to reinforce these uh, symptoms. Okay. For example, now that do you stick to it all? Then, for example, if uh, even your boy two days before the scholarship exam is coming, uh, weakness of the right hand to the OPD, and the OPD doctor strongly feels that there is no neurological weakness, will you still send them to the pediatric neurology? So can we, uh, do you have the capability to exclude a neurological illness without the pediatric neurologist? In, in, a, in a case like this, yeah. That I've heard from the physicians is that sometimes psychiatrists are overcautious. For example, one physician told me at a major general hospital, they, they had a schizophrenia patient who was very violent and aggressive and, you know, and referred to psychiatry and the psychiatrist said, exclude organic and do exclude organic and send. The patient is playing havoc in the ward and the psychiatrists are saying exclude organic and send killer. So, I mean, uh, we should not go to that extent where, you know, sometimes, because that, I don't know, Professor Dina Samara Singh used to tell that, you know, sometimes it's a positive, uh, sometimes we can diagnose, somatization is, dissociation is a positive diagnosis. I don't know if the things have changed now, but I think, so sometimes that's a criticism made about us also. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Dr. Darshani, can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me?
Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, and uh, thank you, Dr. Darshini. That, that was a very inspiring uh, case presentation and the discussion. Uh, so this is, as uh, Dr. Sajivana mentioned, said that sometimes we overdiagnose and sometimes we just overlook at it. And, and as Professor Dina Samasing always mentioned, that it is a kind of a, um, like inclusive diagnosis. As Dr. Darshani mentioned, there are... Uh, okay. Dr. Amiran, can you uh, speak again? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, right. So first of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Darshani and Dr. Hassel are bringing up this very important issue. And it's, as you quite correctly said, that it's quite challenging uh, when we get a referral and sometimes the pediatric uh, unit, they really struggle to manage patients with functional neurological and functional disorders. And uh, so adding to what Dr. Sajivana said, and uh, so this is and uh, so this is mainly the the functional neurological disorders are uh, as you said so there are certain examination findings we can the as dr darshanik really mentioned there are we we have a possibility of diagnosing uh, the functional neurological disorders to some with some sensitivity and specificity and so if we kind of try and mob, the the label them as having a medical or if we are unsure about it and uh, so this can reinforce the illness behavior. So at the same same time, as Dr. Darshan is said, if we overlook it at all, kind of a, we just uh, disregard the symptoms, it can kind of, a, we don't know whether we are, we are we missing a kind of a very serious rare psych uh, neurological condition. And so I think we need to kind of strike a balance. And this is a very, this area needs very kind of a thorough knowledge base and skill level. And uh, as you do, I'm sure in LRH, you get lots of patients with uh, this kind of challenging cases. And uh, so the the main thing is what I feel is, as you said, and uh, so we need to strike uh, the fine balance between kind of a label in the patient and the kind of a not uh, missing uh, rare neurological condition. Just my thought. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, would the speakers uh, have anything to add to that or any other comments to me? Any further questions from the audience? We have uh, no further questions uh, on the online platform either, uh, in which case uh, I suppose we could conclude uh, today's meeting uh, or would there be any final remarks uh, from our speakers, any final messages uh, to the PDC tagging doctors or general medical professionals? Okay. 
uh in that case uh, i just have a few messages to those who have joined uh, in person today uh, please um, there are two registers to be signed uh, one is for cpd points and it says on the top uh, that it's for cpd points so please mention your email address clearly because through snma we will be preparing you an e certificate and we will email it to all of you so please mention your email address in that uh, cpd document uh, we will be keeping both registers outside uh, so that on your way out please make sure you sign on that and the other one is uh, for your general attendance uh, so in conclusion um, i would like to thank the sri lanka college of psychiatrists for your collaboration for the august monthly clinical meeting um, especially the president of the sri lanka college of psychiatrists dr sajeevan amarasinghe Secretary Dr. Marsha De Silva and uh, all the other council members. Um, special thanks to all of you who attended today. And uh, I have a small token of appreciation um, for the two speakers. Uh, first, Dr. Hasala Rajaratna, Senior Registrar in Child and Adolescent Psychiatry from the Lady Literary Hospital. Secondly, Dr. Darshini Hetiarachi, consultant, child and adolescent psychiatrist uh, from the Lady Ritway Hospital. Um, so, thank you very much uh, for that, uh, for the participants and to our speakers and the college once again. Um, I think there will be a refreshment uh, outside for those who have participated. We hope to see you all at the uh, September monthly clinical meeting of the Sri Lanka College of uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association. And uh, many thanks to all of you for your patient hearing once again. Have a good day.